Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all attendees of this um, Focus on Cancer Center seminar series. Uh, I know that we have um, people that are joining us from um, the Western United States, Eastern United States, all over Europe, as well as Israel. So welcome to all. Uh, we have two um, giant speakers today. And it is my pleasure to introduce them shortly. And I have to do it shortly because otherwise I'm going to take all of the time. The first speaker, Charles Sawyer, um, received his BA from Princeton, MD from John Hopkins, followed by residency at UCSF. He became Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in 20, 2002, UCLA, and then moved to Memorial Sloan Kettering in 2006, where he's currently serving as chair of human oncology and pathogenesis program. Dr. Sawyer's study mechanism of cancer drug resistance with the goal of developing novel therapies. He co-discovered the anti-androgen drug enzalutamide, which was approved by the FDA for treatment of, of advanced prostate cancer. He shared the Lasker DeBay Clinical Medical Research Award in 2009 for the development of the ABL kinase inhibitor imatinib for patients with CML and second generation ABL inhibitor with the satinib to overcome imatinib resistance. Dr. Soros received 2003 Breakthrough Prize in the Life Sciences and the Taubman Prize for Excellence of Translational Medical Science, the ACS Medal of Honor for Clinical Research and the Stat Biomedical Innovation Award. He is a member of the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, past president of the ACR, ASCI, and was appointed to the National Cancer Advisory Board by President Obama. He also served on the board directors of Novartis in the last few years. Uh, before we move on, uh, just very brief um, uh, Zoom routines, which you're all familiar with. If you have questions, please post them uh, in the question and answer. Um, following um, a Dr. Sir presentation, we are going to have uh, Swasti or Chang to that will uh, um, um, chair the discussion or oversee the discussion, and uh, we'll move then to our second speaker, Ethan Rupi. Charles, all yours. Thank you for making it. Thank you, Zeb. Um, I need to. Uh, there we go. Okay, I think we're all set. Can, I hope you can see my screen. I, I, all good. All right. So I'm going to take about um, 20 minutes or so to uh, discuss this concept of lineage plasticity. Um, uh, here are my disclosures. Nothing you know really directly relevant to what I'm talking about. So I want to set the talk up with this slide. Um, and it, these are concepts you're all very familiar with, but I think it's useful to just frame them in this way. So there's what I would call on-target resistance to targeted therapy, which as we all know are mutations in the, in the target itself, or there can be bypass pathways that overcome the blockade by activating um, the same pathway through a different mechanism. And in general, these are mutation-based, they're genomic alterations in the tumor, they're fixed and not reversible. Um, and as I'll spend most of the time talking about there's this concept of off-target, you know, drug resistance, um, and so from my, you know, perspective of, of looking across this uh, initially in leukemia and then now in prostate cancer, and, and you know, very familiar with the work of my colleagues here and around the world, um, this concept of cell state changes or lineage plasticity as a way to escape um, therapy, and in general, these have some common features, and that is. The tumor cells acquire more stem-like features, often developmental programs uh, important in embryogenesis are sort of reawakened. And these tend not to be genomically based and they're potentially reversible. I've also intentionally made this triangle wide on the left side and narrow on the right side, because as I think you're all familiar with, and I'll show a few quick examples, there's many, many ways that a target can become mutated. Um, and this presents a challenge, uh, but as well as provides a roadmap 
to develop better next generation inhibitors. Um, but I'm somewhat optimistic that although this is a very challenging area, there were sort of converging on a very small, a much smaller number of sort of molecular pathways that are responsible. There are certainly challenges in drugging them, um, which we'll get in, and I'll you know, give you an example of, of how we are thinking about this in prostate cancer. So I wanna just you know, take that opportunity to go back in you know, history quite a ways um, to remind you that, you know, this, the work that I uh, was a, played a critical role in, in in the development of imatinib and chronic myeloid leukemia, we were, we were the first lab to describe um, these so-called gatekeeper mutations, a you know, now well-established mechanism of acquired resistance to essentially every kinase inhibitor that's now clinic, clinically approved, you know, a rare exception. Um, and, the, and the concept, um, very familiar to you, uh, there's a Threonine residue in this case, deep in the ATP binding pocket, um, forms a hydrogen bond with, with the cleavac and the, the resistance mutation is a bigger amino acid isoleucine. It can't form the hydrogen bond, you get resistance. Um, it turns out that although four or five drugs were subsequently approved after imatinib to overcome other, other mutation-based mechanisms of resistance, overcoming this gatekeeper has been particularly challenging. Um, and Again, it's, it's not brand new, but um, the approval of the drug is very new. It was approved last year. This drug known as ABLE001 overcomes or solves that problem. And it solves it through a very clever mechanism, which is allosteric inhibition, you know, taking advantage of a meristate binding pocket in the kinase domain, far away from the ATP binding site that when engaged with a drug can inhibit the kinase. I won't go into this in any more detail, just showing it as an example of how knowledge of on-target resistance and the, the repertoire of mutations that can cause it guides the development of better and better uh, therapies. Another example of this is you're all familiar with is EGFR mutant lung cancer. Um, in this case, first-generation inhibitors work but ultimately lead to relapse, and the mechanisms of relapse to those first-generation drugs 50% of the time were on target resistance due to a single alteration at the, gate, the gatekeeper equivalent uh, in the EGFR, um, and that's T790M. Um, in, in, in distinct from CML, however, you have these other mechanisms of resistance which are off target, um, accounting for between you know, 40 to, uh, or 45% of the cases. Now, in this case, the solution came pretty rapidly, actually, um, from beautiful work at AstraZeneca, and that's taking advantage of a, of a cysteine residue in the ATP binding pocket, for, for which um, is the mechanism by which osimertinib, a, a covalent inhibitor, gets into the ATP binding pocket and is able to overcome the T790M mutation. And importantly, this drug is also a, a, a fantastic, you know, advance is it's it was the first drug to give really exquisite selectivity for the mutant allele over the wild type allele. It's now, as the clinicians in the audience would know, has rapidly moved from relapse to frontline therapy for these patients. So now that's, that it's in frontline, what does the resistance pattern look like? Well, I showed you here, you know, this blue area, this is more, you know, half of drug of resistance to the initial generation inhibitors. When it's used second line, you know, it's about 25%. And then when it's used first line, we've now shifted the balance of on-target and off-target resistance to just 10% on-target and 90% off-target. So the, the, the lesson, which has borne out in many other examples that I don't have time to show you, is that we can get very smart and clever about how to overcome on-target resistance. But when we put that increased pressure on the target, the tumor can figure out other mechanisms of escape. This isn't just relevant to, to kinase inhibitors. Here's a plot of um, mutations in prostate cancer plotted in patients with metastatic disease versus primary. And if you're on this side of the line, the frequency uh, of the mutations is enriched in metastatic disease. And I'll call your attention to the androgen receptor here. 
which um, makes you know, perfect sense. This is a drugs against the androgen receptor are used to treat um, metastatic prostate cancer um, and uh, mutations in, in the androgen receptor are really only seen um, as a consequence of acquired resistance to hormone therapy. Um, but there are a couple of other alterations here that caught our attention when we were first participating in this consortium and, and seeing the data roll out. And they happen to be three very famous tumor suppressor genes, RB1, P10, and P53. Now you could argue that P10 and P53, they're sort of almost on the diagonal, only modestly enriched. This is just the fact that they're tumor suppressors, so they just cause cancer. But RB1 seems to be fairly enriched in the castration-resistant metastatic subgroup. So not knowing how these, particularly RB1, might be involved you know, in causing resistance to the androgen receptor, we formally tested that um, using human prostate cancer cell lines. And I'm not going to show any of the primary data because it's now you know, four or five years old. Um, but the take home from this paper is that by taking androgen receptor dependent cell lines, uh, prostate cancer cell lines, and deleting RB or P53 using CRISPR or inducible shRNA, um, we showed that in fact, uh, you do get drug resistance if you delete both genes. You don't if you only delete one. And the reason you get drug resistance is because the cells undergo a lineage shift. They acquire, they, they still express luminal markers, including the androgen receptor, but they um, express lower levels and they acquire basal and neuroendocrine features, sort of a mixed lineage. Um, and the, the um, hypothesis as to why they're now no longer responsive to hormone therapy if the, is, the, is they're not pure luminal. And, and the reason hormone therapy works in prostate cancer is not because androgen receptor is, a, is an oncogenic driver, it's because it's a survival uh, factor for that mature luminal lineage. So one of the um, shortcomings of working with established human cell lines um, is that we can't see the process unfold in real time. Um, so um, in order to sort of ask that question, um, how does this plasticity emerge? We took advantage of, uh, of a couple of genetically engineered mouse models that have been developed by David Goodrich's group um, at Roswell Park. And basically they're different combinations of deleting either uh, RBP10 or RBP10 P53. And in both genomic contexts, these mice develop an adenocarcinoma that then progresses to a neuroendocrine prostate cancer. We knew that histologically. What I'm showing you here is a time course analysis of that progression at a single cell level using single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and the way these mice were constructed um, when the tumor suppressor genes are deleted and uh, this cassette um, is activated to now express GFP. Um, we've colored the GFP expressing cells in this red color. So you're seeing a UMAP of all the cells from this series, this time course series of these mice um, during the different stages of, of disease progression. And what you can see is this adenocarcinoma population that we knew about histologically um, that exists here. Um, and then you see the neuroendocrine population here. You see these other different groups in red that are different lineages. That's why they appear in this way on the UMAP. And they're quite interesting. Um, this is an EMT-like population, and we know there's mesenchymal features in certain advanced prostate cancers in human. Um, and here's a, a population defined by a different transcription factor called PAL2F3 that we just happen to know about because our colleagues who study small cell lung cancer have, um, have, have defined a subset of small lung, lung cancer that's characterized by this mutation. This is a force-directed layout, you know, a computational tool or data visualization tool that attempts to um, sort of connect these populations through a, almost a pseudotime type um, analysis. And I'll show you an example of pseudotime in a second. Um, but it puts forth the idea that this population here is the ones, are the ones that emerge first. And then these trajectories suggest that they are the source for these other you know, branches of, of lineage differentiation or plasticity. 
Um, so what's going on at a, at a pathway level in these, um, in these cells here, also shown here? Um, so using just straightforward, you know, gene set enrichment analysis type algorithms, to our surprise, the highest ranked pathways are all linked to inflammation, interferon alpha, interferon gamma, JAK stat, et cetera. Um, surprising, maybe, because you know, this is a set of cells undergoing this plasticity phenotype. Why do they show inflammatory signaling? Um, well, perhaps it's the immune cells in the microenvironment. So the, we know these cells, these, these tumors are invaded um, by a complex array of myeloid and, and lymphocytes. Um, if we use this, time, this pseudotime analysis to look at you know, the sort of key drivers of, of these pathways, we see that JAK, STAT, our IRF7, and many others, they, they come up um, sort of late, so as, the, as the adenocarcinoma starts to um, show signs of plasticity, uh, so in that sort of, sort of cauldron of adenocarcinoma cells that I pointed out earlier, and then it falls off when the, when the tumor cells progress all the way to neuroendocrine disease. Um, we also see that um, uh, uh, this kind of phenomenon in a couple of patient samples that we've looked at at a single cell level. So the mouse model is, is really terrific at, at you know, delineating this time course in a controlled fashion, but it's difficult to work with functionally because that particular mouse, if you're paying attention, has uh, over six alleles that need to be crossed you know, to generate the mice, and, and if you want to now do knockout, further knockout studies, it's challenging. So we wanted to go to a different system for that reason, as well as to ask another question, and that is, is lineage plasticity uh, that we're seeing in the mouse a consequence of living in that microenvironment of an immune infiltrate, or, or does it, can it occur in a cell autonomous fashion? Um, and to address this question, we move to organoid culture. Um, and what we do here is we just plate normal prostate organoids from a normal mouse that happens to have flox alleles for RB and P53, but those genes are intact until we add virus to delete them. And what we see with incredible, re incredibly reliable kinetics is shown in this bar graph um, and pictorially here. The cells, the, the organoids have this normal cystic appearance, and here's a normal cystic um, organoid um, for uh, you know, the first two weeks, and then rather abruptly during this second two weeks, they all, almost nearly all of them transition to this phenotype here where the cells are all filled in and we call that hyperplastic. The, the, um, what's shown in the cartoon is the normal architecture of an outside basal, la uh, basal layer and an inner luminal layer is all mixed up and so the polarity is lost. And eventually we see migration into matrix gel, a phenomenon we call slithering. Um, so if we now look at this process at the single cell level, we learn a couple of really interesting things. So here's um, the UMAP of the starting population. So these are normal mouse prostate organoids. Um, and uh, we see that there are two luminal populations and three basal populations that all cluster together. Within two weeks of deleting the tumor suppressors at a time when the morphology looks completely normal, um, we see this big shift in gene expression. Um, so a shift away from the normal profile, as well as a convergence uh, into you know, a, 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 a sort of mixture uh, of cells that are more alike, uh, like each other than distinct. And that progression goes, you know, gets worse or gets more dramatic with time. Um, to get a little bit more of a handle on what's actually going on here, we took advantage of signatures of basalness along the y-axis and luminalness along the x-axis. And you see that displayed here in the starting population as two distinct populations. What we're trying to show you here is that um, within those two weeks, it, where they still look like this, we see this mixing of the two populations that gets more dramatic over time. Furthermore, if we add enzalutamide, you know, which is the treatment for prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer, this mixing process is accelerated. So our interpretation of this is that plasticity, which is initiated by the tumor suppressor genes, first of all, um, can occur in a cell autonomous fashion. The only cells in this model 
are the epithelial cells. And second, when we now inhibit the androgen receptor, that pro plasticity process is accelerated. So, so as I, I showed you in the mice that, you know, jack stat and inflammatory pathway signaling was activated in the mouse tumors. The same is true in the organoids. And that's shown here um, uh, with, you know, LIF or IL-6 pathway signaling, JAK-STAT interferon. And we also now see FGFR signaling. Um, so um, is this um, RNA signature active pathway activation real? Well, we see phosphostat activation clearly happening um, when we delete the two tumor suppressor genes at baseline and in the presence of EGF. Um, furthermore, we can inhibit that with JAK kinase inhibitors, and interestingly, in this case, we use ruxolitinib. And we also, you know, interestingly, see that expression of the androgen receptor, which goes down as these cells progress, but still present, um, is now restored to higher levels, you know, or baseline levels when we inhibit JAK kinase signaling. Um, so another, you know, sort of question in this puzzle is what's going on, how, is, how are these pathways activated? We were in this you know, defined media conditions, there's no interferon in the system. Well, using computational tools to look at ligand receptor pairs to look for, to positing that there's an autocrine loop, we found LIF and FGF as the key factors uh, that were predicted, and then we confirmed these through functional studies. Um, that then led us to do what I you know, believe is the you know, most important experiment, and that is to ask in organoid culture where you, where you have plasticity established due to deletion of these tumor suppressors, can you reverse the process with these inhibitors? So what's shown here is a series of uh, pictures of the organoids, um, and the, the punchline is, is in the bar graph. Um, the summary is that the combination of giving ruxolitinib, the JAK kinase inhibitor, and ertafitinib, a FGFR kinase inhibitor, leads to a restoration of the cystic morphology over about a two-week period of treatment. Um, furthermore, um, that restoration uh, of, of um, luminal or cystic morphology coincides or is accompanied by a resensitization to the androgen receptor inhibitor enzalutamide. These cells at the beginning are very, are, are insensitive to enzalutamide, but now their sensitivity is restored, essentially comparable to a wild type organoid in this model. So I'll, I'll wrap up with this last slide or two. Um, what, I've, what I've shown you is using mouse, a mouse gem model, as well as mouse organoids. And I don't have to show you, have time to show you there, we find evidence for this in patient samples as well is there is a, um, a highly plastic state uh, generated early after deletion of the tumor suppressor genes. It doesn't require accessory cells, at least at the beginning, and it's, uh, and it's characterized by the activation of these pathways. And if we pharmacologically perturb these pathways, we can push them back to a castration sensitive state. Um, and here's the key people in my group who, who did the primary work in my lab, and then Joe Chan and Donna Pear did all the computational work. Um, I believe I can skip this because I just more or less said it for the sake of time and just go back to this opening slide to say that, um, yeah, I, as I said at the beginning, what defines this are cell state changes. What I've shown you is that we, we don't have to just throw up our hands and go, how are we gonna drug that? Um, we found really completely to our surprise that these two pathways, JAK kinase and FGFR, are, are potential avenues in to treat these patients. But I want to underscore what the, what the actual treatment effect was. It wasn't tumor shrinkage. It was reprogramming back to a luminal lineage, which we then would have to treat with luminal drugs such as antiandrogens. So we'll see how it's going to be challenging to play this out in the clinic but that's certainly something that we're quite interested in. All right, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. We'll do a short questions 
uh, now for you just maybe four to five minutes. And then uh, we'll go on to Dr. Rupin's talk and then we'll have a sort of combined discussion at the end. Um, your talk was fascinating. Uh, and I'll start with questions while we're waiting for people to put questions in the Q&A uh, section. But I'm, I'm really curious to know what you think in terms of both the examples you showed us with the lung cancer and the prostate cancer are driven by single strong driver pathways, right? Either the fusion or in the case of prostate cancer, the androgen receptor signaling pathway. So do you think this change towards lineage plasticity and reprogramming is restricted to cancers where you have these single strong driver events and you might not see such a concerted uh, gene expression response if you had a more subclonal or you know, a plethora of drivers all pushing towards cancer formation? Well, um, maybe I'll, I understand what you're asking, but I, I might sort of rephrase it a little bit. I, I actually believe that all cancers have drivers and they probably have strong drivers. They have to start with something. We just don't have drugs against a lot of the drivers, so we don't know what would happen <laughs> if we inhibited them. Well, I guess my, the way I think about this is um, if you inhibit a driver you know, pretty well, but not completely, um, the easiest path to um, resistance is going to be just restore that driver in some way. Um, uh, because, it, I mean, obviously tumor cells don't think, but um, it's a lot more energy and work to have to reprogram yourself to evade a targeted therapy than to just, you know, acquire a mutation that gives you acquired resistance. Um, so um, I don't know if I'm really getting to the answer to your question, but um, the um, this plasticity, I believe, really is a is a consequence of extreme pressure on the conventional sort of growth of the tumor, um, and we see, and I think we we see something like this with chemo, certain chemotherapies as well. Um, so it doesn't have to be you know classic targeted therapy, but I actually would put forth that a lot of chemotherapies that we think of as sort of general poisons are actually targeted agents with very specific functions that work in select patients. That's going to have to be a, a different talk. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Zeb has a question. Zeb, do you want to ask it yourself or do you want me to ask the question? And I can ask it myself. So if you would mutate uh, not a simultaneously um, uh, 53 and, uh, and, um, and um, any other gene, I'll be in this particular case, but uh, at different stages of uh, uh, organoid uh, transformation, would you expect to get a different picture that may highlight uh, differential targets that can be considered for therapy? Um, interesting question. We actually, we haven't done it. I and mean, we've, we've moved, we're so um, impressed with the um, sort of facility of the organoid system that we just, and, and what I like about it is also these are primary cells. They've never been in culture, and we can, you can, you can do CRISPR modifications fresh out of the mouse and have exactly what you want, you know, in two days, and then follow it. So you're asking if we initiate a process and then later delete p53. Yep. Um, we haven't done it, but it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I, I would, I don't want to maybe say this as an absolute, but I think p53 is absolutely critical loss of p53 to have the ability to even think about reprogramming yourself. Um, so. Right, I mean, I, I, most models that we use and rely all on um, rely, rely or utilize simultaneous deletion of uh, multiple genes, which uh, usually this does not recapitulate what happened in the human tumor. And therefore, uh, if you have stage-wise or step-wise event, uh, you may get different signaling pathway that uh, can highlight changes that could also provide new targets that we have not thought about. And that's basically the... Yeah, it, 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 it is possible experimentally to do that in these systems by just doing it sequentially. Rather, you don't have to build, you know, different Cree drivers or, you know, or, or uh, different recombinase drivers to make it happen. Um, and, you know, along the same, I, I think a lot of the questions actually that are coming in are getting at the same sort of core philosophies of what you were talking about. So, do you, Christina has the question of, do you think your findings on plasticity apply to other tumors, the transition from adenosarcoma to small cell or neuroendocrine? Like, is this a more generalizable phenomenon? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question and a great point. I mean, the, the, abs the answer is absolutely yes. And, and the names of the transcription factors that we identified in those different sort of branches of plasticity that come out from the initial prostate adenocarcinoma, um, they're identical to the ones seen in small cell lung cancer. Um, we can line them up and their transcriptomes, you know, we, there's the, the group of Charlie Rudin here works on small cell lung and has single cell data sets. We've overlapped them. It's incredible how common uh, they are, even though they come from completely separate lineages in an adult. However, I will remind the embryologist, the embryologist will remind us that they all are derived from common endoderm precursors. So a developmental biologist would say, ah, this is not surprising at all. Um, if there's perhaps a good news lesson in there, it's, it's, this, it's this whole idea of me you know, drawing the triangle on the right side a little narrower. There's a common set of targets that's gonna emerge from this. We just have to figure out what they are, can we drug them and can we, can we do it safely? And you know, I, I think you're right. I think the, the triangle is a great way of, of sort of depicting what could be happening or how we could target it. But in terms of sort of the mechanism of how this is happening, so we have a couple of questions sort of linked and I'm gonna compress them into one question just in the interest of time. But are, are you thinking of this in terms of, is this some sort of epigenetic reprogramming? Is it something that that's why it's reversible and you're basically able to rescue your androgen receptor programming um, later on in these cells? So is this something that's gonna be like a methylation thing or is it, some clonal selection for a subpopulation of cells that have this differential gene expression program? Um, I, I think it's absolutely a reprogramming phenomenon. Um, I don't think it's subclonal selection. We, we have not completed barcode experiments to formally prove that, but um, we have you know, looked carefully day by day after adding the drugs and we don't see any cell death or dropout. We see the same set of organoids we have movies of them, you know, over time um, undergoing morphological sort of reluminization. Um, so I think uh, I, I think it it is I, I think it's sort of Yamanaka factor like in this reprogramming idea. Um, the the details to be determined though. And sorry, this is was really a fascinating talk. We're going a little bit over time, but I think we have two minutes for a couple of follow ups. What the, the sort of intercellular communication or the secretion of cytokines and other growth factors is really interesting. Do you think that's a bud off from this gene expression reprogramming or do you think that's the thing driving the gene expression reprogramming? In which case, where are those secreted factors coming from, from the cells themselves? We, 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 we think it's an autocrine loop. They're coming from the tumor cells themselves. Um, at least th th that's the explanation for the biology we see in organoid culture. That doesn't mean that that's the only source in the context of a human or a mouse, um, because clearly the, the lymphocytes that infiltrate these tumors are capable, as well as some of the stromal cells. Um, so I, I think it's an, you know, it's an orchestra of signals. It just so happens, and we're kind of lucky in the organoid system that we can you know, get to such a reductionist model and still see the phenotype. Yeah, um, okay, last question, and then we'll have Dr. Rupin give his talk. Um, I'm gonna just read out this question because I'm not really sure where the question is getting at, and then you can construe it for us. In the context of dividing cells, can you distinguish between trans differentiation from differential fitness of different cell states in the altered genome? I think, um, I think the question, I mean, the, the way to answer that question definitively, I believe is a lineage tracing experiment. Um, so, uh, you know, is a, you know, mesenchymal like cell, it, that cell turning back into a luminal cell or is it competing populations with different fitness? Um, we have a lot of data from single, plating single cells from the organoid culture and then watching the plasticity unfold that we think it's, it's the former, it, it's, it's the cell changing its identity. But, it's a it's a great point, and um, the the there's a there's technologies that you're probably all familiar with with uh, so called cell tagging that we can you know we're trying to get working in this system so we can you know answer that definitively. All right, thank you so much, and then we'll 
uh, reconvene for a panel discussion after Dr. Ruffin finishes this. All right, thanks. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ethan Rubin, um, who uh, agreed to deliver his presentation all the way from uh, Israel. Ethan received his MD and PhD in computer science from Tel Aviv University, where he has served as professor of computer science medicines, conducting computational multidisciplinary research, spanning wide variety of topics, including neuroscience, evolutionary computation, neural language processing, machine learning, and system biology. He joined the University of Maryland in 2014 as computer science professor and director of its Center for Bioinformatic Computational Biology, before joining the NCI in 2018. Dr. Rupin's research focused on developing and harnessing data science approach for the integration of multi-omics data to better understand the pathogenesis of cancer, its evolution and treatment. In collaboration with large international network of scientists, Dr. Rupin aims to predict and test novel drug targets and biomarkers to treat cancer more effectively. Dr. Rubin is co-founder of startup companies involved in precision medicine and cancer drug discovery. He also a member of the editorial board of EMBO Report in Molecular System Biology and a fellow of the International Society of Com Computational Biology. He received a number of awards in international and NIH forums in appreciation of his landmark contributions. Eitan, it's all yours. Please take us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's a tall order to, to follow uh, uh, Charles' talk. Um, mine is Monty Python, something completely different. And, and I'll, I'll take you on, on, a, on a very different tour from, from a computational angle of someone who is uh, clinically still minded and, and oriented. Um, okay, so um, let me... Uh, though I'm a computer scientist, I'm really technologically challenged. Let me share my screen. Um, is that okay? Do you see the screen? Yes, I do. Just uh, maybe go to... Yes, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so I, I will uh, describe to you uh, efforts of, in my lab in the last decade to develop methods that harness transcriptomics in, in order to develop a, a next generation type of, of a patient precision oncology, which uh, harnesses the tumor transcriptomics. So these are my disclosures. And, and, and do you see my mouse, by the way? Uh, so the, 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 the relevant, the most relevant one is uh, Pangea Biomed, who uh, I am divested after joining the NCI and has a collaboration agreement with my lab. And, and some of the work that I'll, I'll, I'll show you is, is, uh, is uh, joint with them and, and so on and so on. So I want to describe to you four challenges that we are tackling, uh, uh, that we are tackling when developing transcriptomics-based precision oncology. Uh, the first one is how to use bulk tumor transcriptomics to stratify patients to treatments. The second one is how to use single cell transcriptomics of patients in order to address this challenge of tumor heterogeneity and resistance that Charles Sawyer has pointed to and try to, to uh, optimize patient's therapy, overcoming that as, as best as we can. I will tell you a little bit, uh, as time permits, on the next uh, two challenges, how we can try to address the dynamic evolution of a tumor and how we can try to make precision oncology accessible to the uh, developing world. Um, I, I will not show you results, but hopefully if time permits, I will tell you a bit what we are doing on that. So the first challenge is developing an approach to harness bulk tumor transcriptomics and guide patients' uh, uh, treatments, identify new drug targets, and, and things like that. And, and the approach that, that we have developed harness is, uh, is, is, is uh, built upon the concept of synthetic lethality. So just, just to make sure, uh, do you see my mouse, by the way? Is, is, is my mouse visible? Yeah, we is see it. it? It's okay. Excuse me? We're good, it's good, we see. Okay, great. So as, as all of you may know, you know, if we would only know the synthetic lethal pearls in cancer, that, that would be huge. 
because suppose we know a synthetic lethal pair between genes A and B, that gives us a, a fantastic uh, uh, treatment opportunity, at least conceptually in principle, because uh, um, 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 suppose we take a, we look at the omics data, mutations, methylation, gene expression, copy number, and, and what have you, and we find the gene A is lost in the tumor, and we know the gene A, a and B are synthetic lethal, and we happen to have a drug that targets gene B, then if we give the drug, at least in principle, we get a, 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 a selective killing only of the tumor cells where gene A is inactivated and not in non-tumor cells. And of course, the, the, the best example is PARP inhibitors on the background of BRCA or DNA repair alterations in tumors, but uh, there was a lot of different pairs in different clinical trials, and, and yet we have only uh, uh, believe that we've only scratched the surface of, of synthetic lethality vulnerabilities that could and should be uh, exploited uh, uh, to, to uh, advance our treatment in cancer. And, and the challenges are huge. The space of possible combinations is huge. Uh, what we see in vitro is not, uh, as you know very well, not necessarily what we see in vivo, and so on and so on. But let's leave that for a second, and let us just suppose for a second that God has descended on Earth and has given us the network of, let's say, pan-cancer synthetic lethal interactions that are shared across many cancers, or cancer type indication specific synthetic lethal interactions. What could we do? So we could. If we only would know these interactions, that could be quite, quite awesome, right? So first of all, we could stratify patients uh, to treatment, and this will be the focus of what I'll show you here. So the idea is the following. Suppose you have a drug, and suppose that the drug, just for illustration, has a single target, and uh, which is well-defined, and suppose that the drug has four synthetic lethal partners, and now you have two patients. In one of them, looking at the transcriptomics of the patient, the copy number, uh, DNA sequencing, what have you, you deduce that all the four partners of, of, of synthetic lethal partners of the target of a drug are, are, are downregulated and activated. Then you would, could deduce quite safely that this patient is likely to respond well to the therapy. However, if these are not downregulated, then you can deduce that this patient is not likely to respond to the therapy, at least not by synthetic lethal mechanisms and so on. So knowing the two interactions is a fantastic vehicle to stratify patients to therapies if you know their targets. The other application which, which is quite immediate is synergistic combinations, right? If you know different pairs and, and you can target the genes in the pairs, that gives you opportunities to identify synergy. The third point is to identify novel drug targets because if you identify these networks and you find hubs that means genes with a large number of, of synthetic lethal interactions in the networks, these are likely to be reasonable target, uh, targets for developing new therapies or repair purposing therapies or repurposing even non-cancer drug therapies and, and so on and so on. So the holy grail is really to identify, try and identify clinically relevant synthetic lethal interactions. And, and this is what my lab has been working uh, uh, quite hard in the last 10 years. And I just want to give you an intuition of the pipeline. So first of all, we, we don't start from, from the void. We start from analyzing, you know, cell line data like depth map and so on and so on. And others have described before that by analyzing uh, the, the, the cell line CRISPR knockout data with the expression, even though it's not double knockouts, but single knockouts, but combining it with the transcriptomics, you can identify synthetic lethal candidates. The problem is that even with stringent criteria, you can identify hundreds of thousands of synthetic lethal candidates, and most of them are totally irrelevant clinically. So what we do is we take this initial pool and we look at the tumor data, for example, the whole TCGA 10K tumors and so on, where we have survival, we have some bug response, we have the multi-omics data, and we are looking for pairs of genes A and B that even though each of these genes is inactivated individually, we do not see them inactivated together in the same tumor samples as we would expect 
under some statistical models. And if you think about it, that may testify that their coac inactivation is selected against, and that may testify that they are synthetic lethal. And furthermore, whenever they are co-inactivated uh, uh, together, we actually find that the survival of the patients is better than expected under some statistical models. Again, testifying that when they are inactivated together, they reduce the tumor fitness and increase the survival of the patients. And finally, we apply some phylogenetic analysis because genetic interactions tend to occur between uh, genes that have some simil similarity in functions and have a phylogen similar ph phylogenetic history. And lo and behold, we take hundreds of thousand candidates and we identify a few thousand or hundreds uh, that are supported by the two more data in patients that are much more likely in our minds to be clinically relevant. And then we uh, show, the, show us the money, right? We show the relevance uh, in, in different ways. And, and we published uh, many papers on that. So just uh, the ones in, in, uh, in, in this, uh, uh, at the top, our methodologies were all the time improving our abilities, right? I'm always telling my fellows that since we, the problem is, is quite challenging, there's a lot of confounding factors. A lot of what we do is suboptimal, and hence we have a chance to improve upon ourselves. Then there are some papers where we apply these methods with collaborators, and there is, there is more by now, and we identify new drug targets and combinations. But what I want to focus about in, in a snippet is what I'm most excited about is applying these clinically relevant synthetic lethal interactions of drug targets in order to stratify patients to therapy. So it, it's published work uh, from last year. Just very briefly, I want to walk you via a few highlights. So what you see here in, in the bottom panel is, is, is uh, different uh, types of, of uh, uh, we, we don't do well on chemotherapies because we work on the target level, okay? So we need to know the target. So we do better on targeted therapies and, and, and immunotherapies, checkpoint therapies, where the targets are, are more, more established. And, and, and uh, what you can see is the AUC, the, the accuracy of the predictions of, of this algorithm, which uh, is published and is called SELECT, versus different potential other algorithms, uh, controls that you could think of, that you could use to stratify patients to therapies from the tumor expression data. And you can see that overall we, we, do, we do much better. And, and, and across a, a different range of, of targeted therapies across different indications. And the same thing you can see when we look in response to checkpoint therapies, both PD-1 combinations, CTLA-4 different indications. And, and you can see the types of uh, AUCs and so on that we have got and published. And I want to emphasize, all this is done on independent clinical trial patients data, which we never train on. So we are not doing standard machine learning, which is prone to overfitting as you know, and know, and many of these data sets are small. You actually cannot do any machine learning on them. We are inferring the interactions on the TCGA from the cell line data on the, on the TCGA. We are inferring the clinically relevant genetic interactions, taking them of the different drugs, taking them as is, and applying them as is to predict the response of, of the patients based on estimating the fraction of interactions, let's say synthetic lethal interactions, that are inactivated in a given patient uh, two more by its expression, and if we have the copy number, also the copy number, and so on and so on. Furthermore, uh, in that paper, we, we looked at a, 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 a quite unique trial, the Winter trial, which had two arms. They uh, prospectively uh, uh, allocated treatments to, to stratify patients to treatments based on the standard actionable mutation arm, which you know has a very relatively low coverage and, and is quite problematic, and a transcriptomic arm, and they had their own algorithm, which was quite simple. 
and and uh, overall they uh, uh, the, uh, reported that they could help about 10 or 15 percent of the patients and we had this data very aggressive tumors across different indications and what we could show is that first of all by looking on these synthetic lethal patterns scores of 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 these patients uh, we could predict the actual response that was observed again retrospectively with about a accuracy of 75%. But what is more interesting, if we are right, and that of course remains to be studied carefully, we estimate we, that we could have stratified patients to effective therapies, uh, not 15% of the patients, but actually 50% of the patients could be helped if we are right uh, uh, based, based on, 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 on uh, SL-based indications. In a new version of this algorithm, which we just placed uh, on BioArchive in collaboration with uh, Pangea, we developed a new algorithm, which is called Enlight, and there we measure the the effects uh, uh, um, the, the 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 effects of of stratifying patients by by this approach in terms of the odds ratio of the responders versus the non-responders in terms which are more clinically relevant than the AUC. And you can see the types of the odd ratios that we get across targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and especially in molecular, uh, in monoclonal antibodies, where the targets are really well defined, and I'm reminding you, we are working on the target level, you can see that we get uh, extremely impressive uh, odds ratio of, 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 of predicting the response of the predicted responders versus non-responders. All this is done on a totally new bunch of 20 different clinical trials information that appeared just in the last year in an unsupervised manner. We are not training on them. And, and this, this is the type of the results that we get. So to move a bit prospectively, uh, Pangea uh, together with the Shiba Medical Center Cancer Center has uh, started doing recently uh, compassion-based treatments in preparation, moving into a, a clinical trial in a few centers in Israel. So uh, this is a report of 21 cases that they recently compiled with Sheba. So uh, a large number of the patients actually for which were sequenced and so on, uh, for various reasons uh, were, were not matched with the treatment. And, but, and, and, and overall seven patients did receive uh, an latmite treatment. What is, is quite encouraging is that one patient had a stable disease, but six patients have uh, uh, imaging-based uh, response, resist criteria, and, and also clinical response. And two of these patients, which we are now writing up as, as case studies, have exceptional responses and actually have no disease. One of them is already followed up for two years. So, so of course, these are very small numbers and, and, and should be carefully studied further. And indeed, uh, with the support of NCI leadership, we have, final, have finalized uh, uh, the protocols of a prospective trial uh, in five different indications with many fantastic clinical collaborators in the NCI in our clinical center, which will start this fall. Uh, we have uh, the sequencing machines and, and, and all the varieties we will do for each patient whole exon sequencing, methylation arrays, and, and what I'm most excited about, we'll do RNA-based sequencing and we will uh, uh, stratify patients in a multi-arm study, uh, bring recommendations to tumor boards and learn prospectively um, what we can do. And, and of course, fingers crossed, and it, it needs to be uh, seen. So this has been, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so on, on, on uh, um, bulk transcriptomics, but um, there is, I believe that in some time, maybe not so far, we will start looking at single cell data of patients' tumors, and we would like to have to develop methods to stratify the treatments based on that. So as you know, right now, the cost of, of this multi-omics bulk sequencing is about 4K. That's it for a patient. 
The cost of single cell sequencing is 15K. It, it may seem large, but I remind you that the annual cost of treating a, pa a cancer patient in the US is, is you know, somewhere between 100K to 150K. So if only we would know how to make these treatment effects effective, I, I think it's, it's quite fe feasible and, and uh, the, the time has come. And of course there is the chicken and the egg, right? If you are not developing methods, you, you're not collecting this data and so on and so on. So we decided to start and, and get this ball rolling. And we have developed a method to look at, at, uh, at uh, a patient's single cell data transcriptomics from the tumor and understand the clonal architecture of the tumor and device treatments accordingly. So it is based on, 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 on this uh, uh, wonderful data set that came recently from Itaiti Roche lab at the White Swan, which has that single cell transcriptomics to 170 cancer cell lines, for which we have, of course, both the bulk and the single cell. And without going into details, you can build machine learning models that aim to predict the response, not from the bulk, from these you have, you know, a dime, a dozen, but predict the response on the cell lines from the single cell data. And um, of course, if you're interested, I can explain more how we did that. So we build these models. And now we have models that look at single cell data and for about 45 targeted cancer drugs and chemotherapies, we can predict the response from single cell data, at least according to these benchmarks that we had in the cell lines. So we devised an algorithm based on this predictor to take a patient's two more single cell data and, and predict the response to a variety of drugs. So what we do, first of all, given the patient's single cell data, we identify, we cluster, we identify the transcriptional clones. Then uh, given a set of drugs, we, uh, given a drug that we want to predict the response, we predict it for each clone based on its mean expression. And if there is a combination, we take as the, uh, uh, the, the, maximal, uh, uh, um, the maximal killing of a given drug in the combination as the overall response of the clone. And if we have several clones in the tumor, we take the, minim the, the, the minimum response that is observed on any of the clones as the response of the tumor, because we are assuming that the resistant clone will indeed uh, develop and, and, and signify the patient's response. So based on, on these machine learning predictors and this uh, heuristic algorithmic approach, we collected a few single cell data sets. We managed to find three of them that are in clinical trials where we have the single cell transcriptomics of the patients, and we studied our ability to predict the response. So one of them is in multiple myeloma, and overall we get an AUC of about 80%. And what I want to emphasize is that on the right-hand side, you can see that if we apply bulk expression-based machine learning predictors, we, we, we get you know, very, 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 in one case, it's almost random. In another case, you know, it's, it's really a uh, subpar inferior per performance. And, and here is a, another data set, CDK inhibitor treatment in, 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 in breast cancer, single cell clinical trial. And, and again, uh, we get a pretty decent response based on, on single cell clonal structure prediction of the response of the patients. This is like the clonal architecture of the patients. And, and uh, if you apply bulk-based machine learning predictors, you almost get nothing. Um, this is a third data set. This was data set is, is in non-small cell lung cancer. It's very interesting because here we had sequential time point biopsies of patients after the treatment, pre-treatment and after the treatment. And what we see is that in, in the patients which progressed under the treatment, we see actually that our estimation of the lack of response, the emerging resistance uh, 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 in the samples that we see indeed increases over time from the start of the treatment in the non-responsive patients, but doesn't increase over time in the responsive treatment. And furthermore, we can follow the initial clones structure and their predicted response. And we see indeed that the clones that were non-responsive, predicted to be non-responsive to the treatment, are selective and evolving in time, uh, taking more and more of the tumor landscape uh, as time, time elapses from the treatment. So 
by now we have um, um, presented uh, uh, two approaches uh, to extend the current scope of, of, uh, of uh, uh, patient stratification in precision oncology from the mutation-based panels to transcriptomic data. One of them is based on synthetic lethality and bulk tumor expression, which is tested you know, on, 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 on a large array of, of different independent clinical uh, trial data. And this initial in development single cell based approach, which I believe will take a more important role in the future, for which we add only three data sets uh, so far to test and validate. And, and all this, this uh, work is, is publicly available on BioArchiv and the algorithms and, and, and so on and so on is described only. So I, I describe these two and I want to tell you something about the, the next challenges and what we are doing. But I do not know how much time do I have still? Zev, anyone? About, about five. Five minutes, that, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. So. The, the third challenge is, you know, uh, uh, following up, understanding, trying to understand what's happening to the tumor and how can we realign the, the treatment during the tumor dynamic evolution. And obviously to do that, one would like to look at the transcriptomics in the blood. And uh, the one option is, of course, is to fish out uh, circulating tumor cells, look at them, apply our synthetic lethality mechanisms on them, and so on and so on. Uh, so that's work in progress in my lab. The other is to look at the bulk expression of the white blood cells and deconvolve them and understand something on deconvolve the transcriptomics, understand something on the immune landscape of, of, of these cells and, and learn something about the correlation between what you see in these immune cells after the convolution and what's happening in the immune cells in, in the tumors. And this is especially relevant in immunotherapy. So we have a very large study with collaborators in the NCI where we are collecting uh, uh, matched samples from the blood and from the tumor, uh, hundreds of samples in prostate cancer and in lung cancer. We are doing uh, methylation, DNA sequencing and RNA expression and applying these the convolution methods to see how much can we look in the bulk expression in the blood and predict what's happening in the tumor. And, and there is a signal and the results are very interesting. In parallel, we are analyzing match data, single cell data of immune cells in the blood and in the tumors and asking how well can we look at, what does the CD8, single cell CD8 expression that is in the blood since it's circulating and, and, and you know, uh, and so on, uh, to and from the, the, the tissue and, and from the tumor, what can we learn from looking at the blood and on the tumor? And, and again, this is something that we are writing up and I, I think we'll put on by archives in a month or two. You can learn quite a bit of what's happening in the tumor from looking at the blood. The fourth challenge is, is uh, quite exciting. We, with collaborators in Australia, we developed deep learning models which enable us to look at the HNE slides of, of, of tumors. And from the HNE, you, you may be aware people have been uh, uh, quite successfully predicting uh, a certain array of actionable mutations. We, we took it, uh, uh, I think, a significant step further, and we have built a, fr a framework to predict the tumor transcriptomics from the HNE. And once we can predict the tumor transcriptomics from the HNE, then we can apply our synthetic lethality approach and stratify patients to tumors. And actually, we are now finalizing a paper with Carlos Caldas on, on, on breast cancer. And, 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 and actually, he has published, you may have seen recently a paper in Nature that's based on the uh, uh, tumor transcriptomics and some machine learning models. He can predict the response of patients quite actually to some targeted therapies. We actually show that we achieve similar accuracies of, of stratifying patients just by looking at the HE images 
of these samples that he gave us. So we're looking at the HNE images, predicting the transcriptomics, applying our synthetic lethality approaching and achieve similar or even better performance than these machine learning omics based models that he, he just uh, uh, published in nature. So, so stay tuned for that. We will uh, place it soon. We are um, doing a variety of other things that may be related, more relevant uh, for people uh, who are, are looking to identify targets, but I'm running out of time. So I'm just pointing you to that paper that just came out. If you want to see how to find optimal combinations to treat patients, to, to treat patients based on, on single cell uh, tumor uh, omega expression, it's another approach from what I presented. And I mentioned this, the convolution issue. So this is like batch black magic. It's a framework where you can take bulk expression and turn it into virtual single cell. But I can answer in questions. And this is my lab in our garden. And thank you so much for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupin. That was a great talk. I'm going to ask you a quick question uh, because Zeb brought it up and I also had a similar question as to what you think about the relative merits of using proteomics, phosphoproteomics, these sorts of drug beat conjugated technologies to look at the protein landscape rather than the gene expression landscape when you're doing these sorts of predictive modeling studies. Um, of course, proteomics are closer to the phenotype, and this is something that you can do. But as you know very well, there's always different trade-offs, right? So of course, there is the CPTAC data, which is the proteomic analog of the TCG, and we are looking at it and so on. But uh, we are also working with a, with a group in Sydney, which is uh, Roger Reddell, which is doing the largest proteomics uh, landscape uh, effort in the world right now, actually much larger than, than uh, CPTAC. Um, but uh, there's, there are serious problems, okay? So first of all, the coverage is not genome-wide as you have in with DNA sequencing or transcriptomics. Second of all, there's platform issues, compatibility issues, mass specs, for example, it's not easy at all to compare between the mass specs that are used in Sydney and the mass specs applied by CPTAC. I think that phosphoproteomics is obviously extremely important, right? What information on signaling networks and so on. But again, phosphoproteomics is very, the coverage is very partial. We don't know a lot of the landscape of the phosphorylation events. We have no idea what they are doing. So ideally, yes. And also single cell proteomics is emergent, right? And, and, and also spatial uh, proteomics from the tumor. I mean, we are, we are living in a very exciting period and I didn't talk at all about spatial transcriptomics, right? And so on and so on. Um, so right now we are not investing a lot of effort in proteomics. We, we have one or two projects out of 65 that are going on in my lab in proteomics. And, and maybe it's a mistake, but one has to make his choices. Fair enough. Um, can I ask uh, you to come back on as well, Dr. Sawyers, and turn on your video and audio? So we, I, I have a question that I think getting both your perspectives on would be really insightful, which is what do you, what, it, it, I know you both work on biomarkers to predict sort of targeted drug discovery in terms of how the tumor evolves, et cetera, to make um, therapeutics more personalized. How do you see in future? us incorporating more holistic inf information in terms of the patient demographic, their socioeconomic status, maybe their race or ethnicity, their age. How do you see all this getting incorporated into the various whole omics um, strategies we use? Charles, you want to be first? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, it's, 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 a uh, it's, it's a complex topic, as you know. Um, I will say, I, you know, we're not trying to do something like that in my own group, but I'm part of this project that was that's hosted by ACR called Project Genie. It's a it's a large cancer registry um, of patients who undergo clinical tumor sequencing at different institutions in the U.S., Europe, Canada. Um, and one of, 
one of the things that we were now able to do is um, because it's 120,000 patients, we can look at self-reported race and we can also look at um, what is called genetic ancestry, which is um, which amazingly can be determined from panel-based sequencing, even of just tumor. Um, but whether this addresses your question or not, we're building data sets which reveal the frequency of, for example, um, BRCA mutation in men with advanced prostate cancer is very different depending on your ethnicity. And there's about 10 examples like that that I can give you that just came out of looking at this large data set. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> is that, is that well, for, the most practical thing it means is that, you know, there's access to care issues here, of course. Um, if, so, if some you know, ethnicity has a very high frequency of a certain mutation and there's a drug for it, we need to make sure they get tested. Um, but there's a scientific you know, question underneath it, which is why is it different? Um, is it you know, environment, zip code, toxins, whatever, smoking, um, or is it gene-gene interaction, you know, a modifier, et cetera. So I'm not answering how to build the database. I'm just telling you why it would be interesting. So, so I, just to, to complement that, there is a recent paper by Tim Chan um, on pre building predictors of, of checkpoint therapy in very large cohort, where in addition to the standard and on automotive mutation burden on different multi-omics producers, he adds uh, demographic variables and he actually shows that they significantly increase the predictive power. There's other papers on that domain which actually showed that looking at simple blood uh, measures, for example, the ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes adds a lot of predictive power. So there's a, there's a lot of room to add that and integrate that. And, and so on and so on. So there's a whole field of EH, you know, EMR analysis and what can we learn from it. Um, it's a big buzzword. Um, it has um, presumably a lot of potential. And when I built my branch uh, in the NCI, I took a strategic decision not to go there. And I think it's a good decision. I'm biased, of course. Um, one cannot do everything. You know, so you have to try, right? Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, and I, I know we're sort of running over time, so I'm going to end with a question that actually one of the trainees at Burnham asked, and I think it's a great question. I just feel like we might need you guys to on, talk about this for an hour to fully address this question, but I'll try to get sound bites from you in in response. Which is, you know, I think hearing both of your research programs side by side is really interesting because it does make us think about uh, Dr. Sawyer's approach or, 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 or biological story about, about this lineage plasticity itself just sort of transforming over the course of tumor formation or maybe even over the course of treatments versus I think Dr. Rupin, your talk, which is much more about these existing clonal populations that we can use to predict how tumors will respond. How do we sort of aggregate these two um, into a single sort of more holistic model of what we think is happening or how we can target cancers best? Yeah, well, I have a clear answer, but I let Charles respond before uh, unless, right. Okay, uh, I guess I would say that um, plasticity is trying to, anticipating plasticity is trying to predict the future. Um, and it's a probability, I, I think of it as a probability game. I didn't have time to really get into it, but there's some tumors for which we have a whole host of inhibitors and really pressure the target and you never see plasticity. So why is that? Why do some tumors have the ability to do it and some don't? The example I like is a GI stromal tumor, GIST. If you have a kit mutation, there's like three or four or five different really potent kit inhibitors that can come out in different ways. You never get off target resistance. Um, same is really true in, in chronic myeloid leukemia. I mean, there, there may be a few exceptions, but um, so I think it's the make your genetic makeup at the start that you either are built to, to have the potential to undergo plasticity or you just can't do it. 
And you know, to Zeb's earlier question, I think P53 is a key thing. That doesn't mean you if your P53 wild type is impossible, but um, your probability is much less. So I guess I would say it's an odds game. Um, Thank you. So, so my, my take on it is, is again, complementary, you know, different perspectives. Um, so I, I, I'm very translational oriented in my research and really I, I'm trying to, I'm a practical XMD. I'm trying to see when I wake up in the morning, how can I try to do something for patients? So Charles has done already a lot of that. I haven't, so I'm trying to. And the way I am trying to address that is my third challenge, develop methods that look at the blood and, and, and trace the dynamic evolution of the tumor and be able to tailor and modify the treatments from looking at the blood transcriptomics, either single cell or uh, CTCs or, or bulk or, or together, because we cannot take sequential biopsies from most of the tumors and so on. So we have to develop methods to look at the blood. And, and I believe we will, and we are advancing. And uh, I promise in five years to show results. Otherwise, you can get me fired. That's what I, right? That's my take. Thank Look you. Much. We'll just have you both back in five years to give us the updates on progress. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who stayed. I do apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, in the interest of time, we had to pick a few. But thank you so much, both of you, for excellent talks. Thank you so much for the kind invite. Likewise, thank you. And you were you're a great moderator. <laughs> thank you. I could see the Indeed. coming in. <laughs> <laughs>